Kaupata rupyasca kripa sindhu bhayevaca patita nam pavan ebyo vaisna vibyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So chapter 2 is sometimes called Sankhya Yoga and sometimes it's called Atman, Atman Atma Viveka Yoga. Sankhya Yoga is the yoga of discrimination and Atman Atmana Viveka Yoga, discrimination between matter and spirit. Prabhupada simply calls it contents of the Gita summarized. But the Sanskrit names are like that. Okay, chapter outline. We began with the doubts, Arjuna's doubts. Didn't want to surrender. Well, we, what was the beginning of his surrender? What did he do? Arjuna starts to surrender. What was the sign that he's starting to surrender? Yes? Maharaj, he expressed his confusion that he can't make his decision on his own. Right. And then what did he do? He couldn't make his then, decision on his own, so? And then he surrendered to Krishna. He's saying, I am a soul surrendered unto you. Right, right. And then we heard about Gyan, the different examples, the distinction between the body and the soul. Krishna explains the distinction between body and soul. Why would Krishna do that? What was his purpose? Why is Krishna talking about the distinction between the body and soul. What's his reason? Yes? Uh, Maharaj, since uh, Juno was uh, uh, looking from the bodily platform, so, so Krishna wanted him to understand the difference between body and soul. Yes, to, de the to defeat which argument? Arjuna was arguing, he didn't want to fight, so why did Krishna explain Gyan? Yes? Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept me, I'm Guru uh, Maharaj, uh, Arjuna said that, how can I kill all these people? How can I kill my own kinsmen? And Remember, there were four reasons why Arjuna didn't want to fight. So this distinction between body and soul was to defeat one of the four reasons. Which reason was it? Sinful reaction, Maharaj. No. no. Compassion, Maharaj. Huh? Compassion, compassion, right. Compassion. compassion, right. Compassion, right. And then Karmakanda. Why did Krishna explain Karmakanda? What's that got to do? Karmakanda, that's material. Why is Krishna... Enjoyment, Maharaj. Enjoyment. Oh, yeah. So, can you tell me more why Krishna explains Karmakanda? Because Arjuna gives the reason that how he can enjoy uh, after, uh, you know, killing everybody, whom he will enjoy with. Or his enjoyment will be in question if he fights the war. That's where Krishna explains that you will not enjoy if you don't fight the war. Actually, Either way you will enjoy if you fight the war, even if you go to heaven, or if you win the kingdom, either way you will enjoy. So he contracts that argument. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes. And now we're going to hear about Buddha Yoga today. Buddha Yoga, we'll hear about what that is. And then we still have to hear about the Stita Dir Muni. Right? So those two sections have got to be covered. All right. The process of transmigration with reference to Bhagavad Gita 222. Who remembers 222? What's that verse? Yes? 
Yes, good, right. So we talked about that, changing the clothes, changing the dress, it's just like the change of the body. And we explained also two types of swadharma. What are the two types of swadharma? Yes, two types of swadharma. We have one when we're… there's a difference in swadharma depending on if you're a conditioned soul or a liberated soul, right? For the liberated souls, their swadharma to serve Krishna according to their particular relationship with Krishna. And for the conditioned souls, how do they serve Krishna? According to… Yes, according to Varnashram, right. And how do we view Varnashram? According to our position? Yeah, do whatever is necessary. According to our situation, we have to do whatever is necessary. Appropriate and inappropriate application of the utility of violence in relation to the battle of Kurukshetra and current issues of religious violence. So appropriate application of violence. We had the, uh, the appropriate example was, yes, someone can tell me what's the appropriate application of violence? Management judge uh, trials a criminal for his uh, act of murder, committing a murder. Right, yes, Manu Samhita, Manu Samhita describes that a person should be hanged, a murderer should be hanged, right. And sometimes the government may also use violence to establish law and order. And current religious violence are based on the bodily platform and we don't encourage that kind of violence, that kind of religious fanaticism. So Krishna defeated Arjuna's arguments such as fear, sinful reaction, indecision and enjoyment by explaining karmakanda. We're going to hear also Buddha Yoga, how that also defeats these arguments. Certainly, enjoyment is defeated by karmakanda, but we'll see also sinful reaction, indecision also. All right, so buddhi yoga, working with knowledge and detachment. It's a nice philosophy. Krishna encourages us, encourages Arjuna and encourages all of us that we have to work, not to be idle. Some people think yoga is to, just to be idle, but yoga is based on action, but at the same time there must be detachment. So Gyan was explained, to remove Arjuna's arguments against fighting, Krishna explained the difference between the body and the soul. Then Karmakanda section, after presenting those arguments, Krishna encouraged Arjuna to fight based on fruit of considerations to gain pleasure and to avoid suffering. Oh, so it's a material philosophy, Krishna explains it here in the second chapter, he doesn't bring it up again. Some people may wonder what's it doing in the Bhagavad Gita at all? Well, Krishna just introduced it just so encourage Arjuna to defeat his argument because Arjuna was speaking so much on the bodily platform that, all right, if you're on the bodily platform, then still you should fight. You will avoid suffering. Now, Buddha Yoga. Now Krishna will instruct Arjuna to combine both. <coughs> Jnana and, <coughs> excuse me, Jnana knowledge and karma activity and to fight with detachment. So this is spiritual activity, buddhi yoga. We will hear about buddhi yoga 
We can see Lord Krishna is mentioning it, mentioning it here in text 39. It's mentioned there. He said, Thus far I have described this knowledge to you through analytical study. Right? That's the word Sankhya. Eshate bihita Sankhya. So Sankhya was Lord Krishna describing the knowledge of the body and the soul. Analytical study. But then Krishna said, now listen as I explain it in terms of working without fruit of result. Buddhi yogi vimam shrinu. Right? Buddhi yoga. Hear me, hear me, I'm going to explain buddhi yoga. Buddhi, buddhiya yukto yaya parta karma pandam prahasyati. Uh, o son of Prita, when you act in such knowledge, you can free yourself from the bondage of works. So this is the point. You do buddhi yoga, there's no karmic reaction. When you work like that, working with detachment, then there's no karmic reaction. Sankhya. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is describing here. What is a Sankhya? That which properly illuminates the tattva of an object is called Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya Yoga gives complete knowledge about the tattva of the Atma and Anatma. Anatma. The tattva of the Atma and Anatma. The tattva of the soul and the body. So Sankhya Yoga gives us that knowledge. Vishnu Chakravarti, and then Srila Prabhupada's purport explains, according to the Nirukti or the Vedic dictionary, Sankhya means that which describes things in detail. The word Sankhya mentioned herein has nothing to do with the atheistic Sankhya Yoga. Real Sankhya philosophy is described by Lord Kapila in the Srimad Bhagavatam. But even that Sankhya has nothing to do with the current topics. Here, Sankhya means analytical description of the body and the soul. We should understand like that, the use of the word Sankhya. It's different from Srimad Bhagavatam. Lord Kapila is there, third canto, end of the third canto. But Prabhupada said that, is, that has nothing to do with what's being used, explained here. Sankhya simply means the analytical description of the body and the soul. So very simple. And then Srila Prabhupada's purport to this verse. The buddhi yoga mentioned in this verse is the devotional service of the Lord. Buddhi yoga means to work in Krishna consciousness in the full bliss and knowledge of devotional service. One who works for the satisfaction of the Lord only, however difficult such work may be, is working under the principles of buddhi yoga and finds himself always in transcendental bliss. So Prabhupada's comparing the buddhi yoga to devotional service. Is it just buddhi yoga is to work in Krishna consciousness? It's the same. Work for the pleasure of Krishna. However difficult such work may be, so just like Arjuna, it's very difficult. The work he has to do to fight a battle, to kill people who are his seniors and who are his respected, respect, respectable relatives. But you have to do it and should be in bliss, transcendental bliss. Then Srila Prabhupada's purport to text 51 in second chapter, last line, Prabhupada has written, service for the cause of the Lord is called karma yoga or buddhi yoga or in plain words, devotional service to the Lord. So, we don't see really a distinction between, uh, Prabhupada at least he's not making a distinction here between karma yoga and buddhi yoga and bhakti yoga.
Although there is technically some dis subtle distinctions, Prabhupada sees them the same thing. Service for the cause of the Lord. That's the point. Subtly there are some differences, but it's all for the pleasure of Krishna. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he's described Buddhi Yoga as the intelligence resulting from Bhakti Yoga. <laughs> you see? So Buddhi Yoga is the intelligence we get from doing Bhakti Yoga. He says that. And then Baladeva Vijabhusan, he defines Buddhi Yoga as Niskam Karma Yoga, incorporating Gyan within itself. So Niskam Karma Yoga with Gyan, with knowledge. So de Niskam Karma Yoga is detached work along with knowledge. And so he de defines Buddha Yoga like that, a little different. And Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's described the process of Buddha Yoga is one. It is known as Karma Yoga, while one's intelligence is applied to Karma, Gyan or Sankhya Yoga, when one is cultivating transcendental knowledge, and Bhakti Yoga, when one enters the stage of understanding his relationship with the Supreme. Pure Buddhi Yoga is Bhakti Yoga. So Bhakti Vinodha, of course, nicely concluded this point, that what is Buddhi Yoga? Is that pure buddhi yoga is bhakti yoga. But if we don't understand the relationship with Krishna, then it's just simply buddhi yoga. Like karma yoga, you don't really understand the, the relationship. If you're doing karma yoga, one doesn't really understand the relationship with Krishna. But in bhakti yoga, to do actual bhakti yoga, we have to understand the relationship with the Supreme. All right, so those are some different points to make it clear what is actually Buddhi Yoga. Going ahead, Krishna minimizes Karma Kanda. So we have an exercise for you, right? Oh, no, wait, sorry. So you can. You can uh, work in some... How many people do we have here in the class today? How many... How many students are there today? Yagna? Yagna Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. How many people are in the class today? Fifteen, Maharaj. How many? 15, 15, Maharaj. Okay, 15, 15. So maybe we can make three groups of five. Or maybe make five groups of three. Be better. Okay, Maharaj. And we want, you, we want to hear from you. What is the relevance of Karmakanda and Vedas in the practice of Krishna consciousness? And then, how are, the how are the practices of ISKCON authorized from Vedic point of view? This is dealing with verses 40 to 46. Shall I open the rooms now, Maharaj? Okay, is everyone clear? Wait, is everyone clear about the exercise? You have to look over verses 40 to 46 and then two questions. The relevance of Karma Kanda in the presence of Krishna consciousness and how are the practices of ISKCON authorized from a Vedic point of view? All right, you can open the groups.
Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, sorry, my internet is a little choppy. I just need to join the house. I'm sorry, can't hear you very well. Uh, I just moved to a new house. My internet is not so good. Yeah, not so good, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Tulsi Krishna is there. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Your internet's okay. Yes, Maharaj. And then who else have we got? Three masters. Just just two of you? I think so. No? No <coughs> okay. And me? Okay. So you want to look over the text quickly? Yes, sure. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Are you in the group, Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. So we're looking over the verse. Did you look over the verse yet? No, Maharaj, we are looking at it. Okay. So Maharaj, the question is that, first of all, we have to, uh, one question is the relevance of the practices we do in Krishna, uh, in uh, ISKCON, right? How are they relevant with this verse? And uh, one question is, uh, explain Karmakanda with relation to this verse, Maharaj. Am I correct? Yeah, well, the, first, the first question is the relevance of the Karmakanda process in relation to the relevance of the karmakanda process in relation to uh, our Krishna conscious practice. Okay, ma'am. That's the first question. And then how is that, how are our how are our activities in ISKCON authorized? Are they according to the Vedas? That's the point, you know, that people may say, you know what you Hare Krishna people do? Oh, it, it's not Vedic. You don't do anything according mm -hmm. to the Vedas. Yes, correct. So, so Pancharatrika Vidhi is not what we should be quoting here, Maharaj. We should quote from this verse. Pancharatrika Vidhi. I mean, whatever practices we have in ISKCON, I mean, uh, the, kind, the way we worship the deity or the way we uh, do our things, they are all from uh, uh, Naradamuni's, uh, this thing, right? Pancharatrika Vidhi. So I'm saying that should we quote that or should we, from this verse saying that, uh, this verse says that whatever little devotional activities you do is much, much higher than 
whatever karmic activities you do, because Svalpa Mapya Se Dharma Stray Toh Mahato Vaya, but for any karma kind of activity, it's never said that it will protect you from any danger. So, which direction we should go, Maharaj? I'm, I'm not able to understand. Well, we follow Pancharatriki, we also follow Bhagavata Vidi, you know, we're not just following Pancharatriki. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, Maharaj, but... Of course, we have to combine the two. Have you ever done any karma candy activities, Krishna, Tosi Krishna Manaji? Yes, Maharaj. You've done some karma candy pujas? Uh, okay. Yeah, where? Yeah. Like the prayers for the departed souls. It's considered as karma kandhi. Uh-huh. You did prayers for... Well, there's also Vaishnava prayers. You know that it's not all karma kandhi. It depends how, who you get to offer the prayers, you know. Of course, if you go to the karma kandhi Brahmins, they will do karma kandhi prayers. But if you, if you invite a devotee, an Iskon devotee, to come and do the prayers, then they will do it according to the the Vaishnava standard. Eh? Where are you? South Africa? Um, not from Malaysia, Maharaj. Oh, from, you're from Malaysia, okay. <laughs> so yeah, the, of course there's Karma Kandi priests there also, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're going to get Karma Kandi people there. We go to the Shiva temple or the Ganesh temple, Murga temple. Yes, my lady. Hmm. So the question is, how do we view these things? What do we think of this? What can we say also about our Hare Krishna devotees? And you know, are we authorized at all? We don't follow any, what shastras do we follow or like that, you know? So people may have these doubts. Okay, I'll leave you with it for a little while. You think it over and more. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Oh, oh, you've got so many people in the group here. Actually, we got merger. Two groups merged, is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So are you having a, have you come to any conclusions yet? We haven't discussed among ourselves. You still, you still, yes, we had. 
Krishna Guru. Because it is the Guru is a merger. But still we have prepared our points. Uh-huh. So you understand the questions all right? This one all right. If you can give us a couple of more minutes, then... Okay, go ahead. Give you a couple more minutes. Recording in progress. have a choice of transit uh, Okay. What else we got? Recording in progress. I am just taking ground of all the roads, what other people are doing. <laughs> no, there is a internet issue, I guess, with the devotees. That's why they are, some are joining and some are... Okay, did you get any conclusions here? Maharaj, we, we studied, we sort of uh, didn't, didn't get opportunity to discuss, but we, we found some points okay. that karma can, can help one uh, like gradually elevate to self-realization. So it's it's one of the steps of the yoga ladder. So that's, that's the relevance in Krishna consciousness. That... Uh, once we start with uh, karma kant, then uh, we come to the level of sakam and then nishkam, and then like that way it can uh, help one go up. Well, we don't encourage that. Yes, yes, ma'am. We don't even encourage going up like that. What do we? We encourage people to go immediately to bhakti yoga. If you're going to go up like that, then it will take you along. Many people that get stuck at Karma Kanda, they'll never come even to Karma Yoga. <laughs> because the problem, is, the problem is with the Karma Kanda, we get, you know, we're offered different material benefits. So that's what people want. That's what's brought us into the material world. We get entangled our material desires and we have to get out of the material world and 
we get involved with, yeah. oh, I can get material benefit this way, I can do that, yeah, yeah, I'll get this and I'll get that. We'll never get to bhakti, we'll never come to karma yoga. And we see so many people doing karma kandi practices, they never come to bhakti yoga. They never come to karma yoga, they get more attached. Yes, ma'am. So that's the danger. So we don't encourage karma yoga, karma kanda. We don't encourage karma kanda activities. They're not spiritual. Uh, actually, uh, uh, sorry. Actually, the thing is that I think that we are still going to understand the question. That's the, the second part of question. So that is why we are not able to get the confusion yet. So the second part of the question. The relevance of Krishna conscious activities according to the Vedic process. Are our Krishna conscious activities authorized by the Vedas? Oh, yes, yes, Prabhu. Yes, we follow uh, uh, authority uh, with, with this, which Veda talks about. <coughs> Yastu Sarvani Bhutanya Anu Pashati, like uh, we, we read that uh, uh, Shaloka in his Upanishadals, where it stands for that we follow uh, authority. Yes. Also, Maharaj, the purpose of Vedas is to know Krishna, and our Krishna consciousness movement is whole based on becoming Krishna conscious by chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Yes, right. Yes. Very good. That's a good point. It is given in the last sentence of the 46th verse. Vedanta is the last word of Vedic wisdom and the author and knower of the Vedanta philosophy is Lord Krishna. And the highest Vedantist is the great soul who takes pleasure in chanting the holy name of the Lord. That is the ultimate purpose of Vedic mysticism. Yes. So... The one who is chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, he is a Vedantist. Veda is knowledge and Anta is the end of knowledge. So Vedanta, the end of knowledge is to know Krishna. So one who knows Krishna, he knows Vedanta. So this is the authority. Chanting of the holy name of the Lord is authorized so like this karma kandas are like for uh, the souls who are suffering in the material world so it will give them some relief from the suffering and um, make their lives better to live over here yes but, but tem temporary temporary, temporary. So this like yeah. in, it's like encouraging people to worship demigods. You know, what does Krishna say about demigod worship in the Bhagavad Gita? Does he encourage it? It's, it's limited. It's, it's limited. He, he, they have limited powers. So they, those, they who, those whose minds are distorted by material desires worship the demigods. To get results which are limited and temporary. So demigod worship is condemned in the Bhagavad Gita. Now the Karmakanda process is also not encouraged, although Krishna is talking about it a little bit here, a few verses there in the second chapter, he doesn't speak about it again, because it's material, it's not spiritual. And we, we may say, well, it's Vedic. It's on the Vedic path. But the problem is, if you go on that path, it takes so long, you may never get there. People get so much stuck on the Vedic path, there's so much, they have so many desires, they never give up their material desires. And there's no end to it. One desire after another, you just go on and on. And so the Vedic path, this Karmakanda path, is not encouraged. Uh, 
And it's described to be like flowers. They're, they're described like flowers. The flower looks very nice, but how long does it look nice? Very quickly, very quickly the flower wilts and grows old. You can't keep them fresh for very long. So karma kandi activities are like that. You do one karma kandi activity, get something, then you want something else, then you want something else. You never stop. Oh, I, I need money, and we go and we worship, and we get some money, and then you get a health problem. Oh, I have a health problem, you have to go and worship and get somebody else, you know, help my health problem. One problem after another. So the karma candy process is not going to solve any problem. It's just going to give temporary benefit. You're treating the symptoms. You're not treating the real disease. Okay, I, we have to go back. Let's get everybody out and we'll discuss it together. Recording in progress. Okay, Yagna, close the room. Okay, is everyone back? Uh, not yet, Maharaj. Everyone back now? Yeah? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, let's go back to the slide. All right, everyone can see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so the relevance of Karmakanda division of the Vedas in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Is it relevant? No, it's not relevant at all. We do not encourage people to do Karmakandi practices in Krishna consciousness. It has no relationship to Krishna consciousness. Now we may think that or will bring me gradually to Krishna consciousness. It's not true. It doesn't happen. There's so many people doing karma kandi practices. They never become devotees. Karma kanda division is only for sense gratification. For people who are absorbed in sense gratification, it's like people who worship demigods. Demigod worship is condemned. We'll see later on in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna condemns the worship of demigods. And the Karmakandi division is just like that. So it's not relevant to the practice of Krishna consciousness. Anybody argue with this? Well, everyone understand? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, how are the practices of ISKCON authorized from the Vedic point of view? Uh, so, uh, Maharaj, so, uh, like it is said that uh, the practices of the Vedas are actually meant to gradually, uh, gradually elevate a person from sense gratification to transcendence. So, ISKCON is actually providing the uh, 
the living entities who are in this material world struggling with the heart for existence to directly come to the platform of transcendence and uh, not follow a gradual process uh, uh, which helps them uh, their sense of gratification so in that way uh, uh, maraj we can understand the practices of this con yeah Yes, certainly. What you say is okay. Uh, what are the actual activities of ISKCON? Worshipping Krishna? Mar yes? Maharaj, the, the best purpose of Vedic uh, culture is served, uh, however, by chanting the holy name of the Lord as recommended by Lord Chaitanya, yes. the deliverer of all, all colleges. Yes. So that is what ISKCON is doing uh, as a practice. Yes, very good. That's a very nice quote. Yes, that is certainly authorized from the Vedic point of view. The chanting of the holy name is authorized by the Vedas, and Iskon is promoting the chanting of the holy name. No? We're called the Hare Krishna movement because we're always chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. We're known to chant, and so this is it. This is what the Vedas also. Encourage people to chant the holy name of the Lord. The purpose of the Vedas. Also, Maharaj, uh, uh, as Bhagavad Gita is part of uh, the fifth Veda, Mahabharata, and it is only through Upanishads that one can uh, come to the transcendence. And because Iskon is uh, stressing on uh, reading Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, in that way also it is. Uh, uh, it is uh, following an authorized Vedic uh, practice. Okay. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, uh, the Prabhupada also writes in the purport that the purpose of the Vedas is to know Lord Krishna and not to be become attached to the rituals. And Iskon is following the, this. Like all the activities done are for the pleasure and service of Krishna, not for us to be elevated to heavenly planets or our sense gratification. Right. Yes, very good. Yes. It's gone. Con, it's gone is not discriminating between caste, color, religion. Now, as you know, it is Prabhupada is writing in his first word. Yes, right. That the big entity part and part of Krishna. Therefore, revival of Krishna consciousness by the individual living entity is the highest perfectional state of Vedic knowledge. And okay. then it has further been confirmed to Shri Bhagavatam. Oh my Lord, a person who is chanting the holy name, although born of a low family like that of a chandal, dog eater, is situated on the highest platform of self-religion. Such a person must have performed all kind of penances and sacrifices according to Vedic rituals and studied the Vedic literature many, many times after taking his bath in the holy places of religion. Such a person is considered to be the best of the Aryan family. Yes. So the one who are chanting and who has taken up this process are above you know, all this karma kandic uh, rituals and uh, what to say, rules and regulations. Yes, very good, very good quotes. It's a very important section. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go ahead. Now, text, text number 40, an, an important verse. Right? Uh, in this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution. A little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. In this endeavor, what is that endeavor? Endeavor for what? Endeavor for us to become Krishna conscious. Endeavor, the endeavor for us to get out of this material world, to get free from the material energy. And so it's an endeavor. And if we make a little, uh, even a little advancement on the path, swapam, a oh, very meager, a little advancement, but it will save us from the most dangerous type of fear, triate mahatobaya. What is the most dangerous fear? What is that most dangerous fear? Losing the human form. Uh, yes, Prabhu, what did you say? Losing the human form of life. Right. Losing the human form of life, falling down into the animal species or lower species of life, 
That is the most dangerous type of fear. So a little advancement on this path can save us from that danger. And it's also mentioned, uh, there's no loss or diminution. Pratyavayo uh, navidyate. Uh, there's no loss. People may be worried, you know, I may lose something. I may, oh, I may be missing something. But th there's no loss. It's, and it's, it doesn't become less by making this endeavor. Rather, we get the greatest benefit. So people are always worried, you know, I'm going to lose something, or oh, maybe I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll lose my position. No, it's the greatest benefit. It protects us from this fear. So this is an, an important statement by Lord Krishna. And then the, another verse, which is also a very important verse for all of us as devotees in Krishna consciousness, because this is the verse which uh, inspired Srila Prabhupada to go to the West. He was reading this verse and he read the purport by Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. And Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur in the purport spoke about the importance of the order of the spiritual master. And Prabhupada remembered how his teacher had asked him to preach Krishna consciousness, so he felt inspired that he had to go to the West. Right? So it's mentioned, Vaya Vasayatmika Buddhi. Right? What is the meaning? What is Vaya Vasayatmika Buddhi? Any of you know? Someone knows? Vaya Vasayatmika Buddhi? Does it mean one-pointed, like, focus attention? Yes, right. One who is very resolute in purpose, right? Very focused in their intelligence, right? They're resolute in purpose. Their aim is one, eka, eka, kurunandana. But those who are irresolute, buha shaka, they have many branches, anantascha. So they're not resolute. But devotee, one who is in Krishna consciousness, is very resolute in purpose. Aim is one. What is their aim? Their aim is simply to surrender to Krishna, to take full shelter of Krishna. That is vayavasayatmikabuddhi, dedicated, completely dedicated for the pleasure of Krishna. So two important verses are given to us here. We should understand the significance of these verses and the statements. And here Lord Krishna is going to describe about the Karmakandi section. This is described here, text 42 and 43. Men of small knowledge are very much attached to the flowery words of the Vedas. They are described, huh? Pushpitam vacham, the words of the Veda, they like flowers. Why are they like flowers? Because the flowers soon wither and dry up, very temporary. And so these words of the Vedas recommend various fruitive activities for elevation to heavenly planets, result in good birth, power and so forth and being desirous of sense gratification and opulent life, they say there is nothing more than this. So this is a very dangerous thing to get into. You get into this kind of thinking, you never get out. You get so entangled with it. We're thinking about, you know, oh, going to the heavenly planets and enjoying there and a good birth and having all the, all the sense gratification. And it's one thing after another. So this is not encouraged at all. And as described here, they, they say there's nothing more than this. This is what happens. They don't think that, oh, this is only the beginning and we're going to something higher. Nobody takes up Karmakandi thinking like that. <laughs> that once they get in, they go into Karmakandi, they, this is it. There's nothing higher than this. So they never come out. So very dangerous. 
We have to be, we keep away from these things, karma kandi activities. Not at all encouraged for Krishna conscious devotee. Veda Vada Rata. Mm -mm. Veda Vada Rata. Prabhupada, was that mentioned? Or is it mentioned there in the. Uh, comes in. Yeah, the Veda Vada Rata, the third line, right? Yai mam pushpitam vacham pravadanti avipaschata veda vada rata parta nanyat astiti vadana. Right? Prabhupada translates this veda vada rata as simply mouthing the words of the Vedas. They're simply mouthing, they're simply repeating, but they don't know the real purpose behind the Vedas. This is a problem. They're thinking, that, well, described here, Veda Vada Rata are those who are very fond of the Vedic rituals, but who cannot understand their real meaning, which is to gradually elevate people to Krishna consciousness. In other words, they lack a transcendental goal. Now you're correct. Their purpose, is, their purpose is to gradually elevate people to Krishna consciousness, but the people who do the rituals are not thinking like that. They're thinking, it's for my sense gratification. The man is thinking, I want a wife. And the couple is thinking, we want a child. And like this, you come, they do so many karma candy rituals for different purposes. There's no end to it. And you get the child and then, oh, have a health problem, oh, we have economic problem, oh, we have uh, so many different problems, you know, there's no end to it. And so you never get away from the karma kandi path. But the real purpose is to bring people to Krishna consciousness. But it never happens. You just get stuck, lost in all the rituals. And of course the rituals look very nice and the Brahmins chanting so many prayers. And he's a Brahmana, right? He's a smarter, he's a ritualistic Brahman, the Karmakandi Brahman. So we should be careful not to get bewildered by these things. This serves to indirectly glorify bhakti by contrast. Bhakti is something transcendental and pure, but this Vedavada Rata, this process of following the Vedic rituals, this is mundane, material, temperate. And so in this way it glorifies bhakti. Bhakti gives much, something much higher. And the example from Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Prachini Barishat engaging in Karma Kandi activities. Those of you who have read Fourth Canto Srimad Bhagavatam may remember about Prachini Barishat and he was killing so many different animals as a sacrifice. But fortunately he was enlightened by Narad, who told him the allergy of Puranjan. Puranjan means one who enjoys in the body. And he told about Puranjan and what happened to him, uh, how he died and uh, took birth again and so many problems, trying to enjoy the body. So Narada Muni warned King Prachini Barishat about the nature of these Karmakandi activities and how all the animals he was sacrificing, they were going to wait and next life they, he was going to have to suffer because he'd killed all, all of these animals. So he was going to get a lot of pain and suffering himself. So we don't do karma kandi activities. And Krishna also says, text 45, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, nice Trigunya Bhavarjuna. The Vedas are dealing with the three modes of nature. Rise above these modes, O Arjuna, 
become transcendental to these modes. So karmakandi activities are in the modes of nature. And Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, get out of, don't do these karmakandi activities, rise above the modes, be transcendental. So Lord Krishna himself minimizes the karmakandi process. Although he presented it initially, now, in the same chapter, just a few verses later, Lord Krishna is minimizing it. He's telling Arjuna, give it up. Become transcendental. And by doing bhakti yoga, then we come to the stage of nirguna, or above the modes of nature. I'll read. When the activities for sense gratification, namely the Karmakanda chapter, are finished, then the chance for spiritual realization is offered in the form of the Upanishads, which are part of different Vedas, as the Bhagavad Gita is a part of the fifth Veda, namely the Mahabharata. The Upanishads mark the beginning of transcendental life. Yeah, I think somebody quoted this, right? As long as the material body exists, there are actions and reactions in the material modes. One has to learn tolerance in the face of dualities, such as happiness and distress, or cold and warmth. And by tolerating such dualities, become free from anxiety regarding gain and loss. This transcendental position is achieved in full Krishna consciousness when one is fully dependent on the goodwill of Krishna. So this is the idea. We want to come to that stage of depending on Krishna. This is bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is nirguna. It's a pure state of spiritual existence. Mm -hmm. All right, going ahead, Prabhupada explains, the highest Vedantist, right, we were talking about Vedas, uh, is ISKCON authorized? Prabhupada explains the highest, the best purpose of Vedanta philosophy is served by inoffensively chanting the holy name of the Lord. So that's important without offence, pure chanting of the Holy Name. The highest Vedantist is the great soul who takes pleasure in chanting the Holy Name of the Lord. Right? We don't want to be forced to chant the Holy Name. Right? We take pleasure in it. It's a, our pleasure. We enjoy it. So that is the, that is the real purpose of Vedanta. Okay, going ahead, Lord Krishna is explaining about karma yoga or buddhi yoga. And here's a nice verse, karmani evadikaraste, meaning Arjuna's adhikar, his qualification or his eligibility is for work or for karma. Arjuna is meant for karma. Lord Krishna is recommending karma yoga here. He's encouraging Arjuna to do karma yoga, right? So, uh, but then Lord Krishna qualifies this karma yoga. He says, ma palishu kadachana, meaning you are not entitled to the fruit. <laughs> so this is uh, very important. You know, people are fond of this verse. We often quote this verse and many people are familiar with this verse. And many materialistic people like to quote this verse. And they say, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I have a right to work. Lord Krishna told Arjuna to work. He's telling all of us we can work, I can work. But they never quote Ma Pali Shukadachana. Nobody, they quote the first of Karmani Evadikaraste, that they, they don't know, Ma Pali Shukadachana. Nobody will say, yes, Krishna said we're not allowed to enjoy the fruit. No, nobody will say that. They'll say we're allowed to work, but they all work for their own sense gratification. So this is 
the misunderstanding. This is the in, in, inappropriate use of this verse in Krishna consciousness. You see how it's wrongly applied? Hmm? What are the appropriate and inappropriate application of the phrase karmani evadikaraste? Yes? Somebody like to answer? What's the appropriate karmani evadikaraste? We're speaking about the qualification to work. In what ways will it be appropriate? In what way will it be inappropriate? Uh, Krishna? Yes, Prabhu? Maharaj, appropriate it will be by, you know, devotees they have had no. while practicing their Krishna consciousness. They should be patient. Because so many times we do our activities and then we immediately think of results. So we should be a little patient. We should just focus on our chanting and our spiritual activities not to be attached with the result of that. So this will be the appropriate application of this. The, you're saying the, the appropriate application will be that we just do our work and... No, we just... I'm, I'm saying in terms of our spiritual... Life. In terms of our spiritual life? I'm sorry, your voice is, your voice is breaking, Prabhu. Yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to hear everything you say because your voice is breaking. Can you try again? Tell me. Am I? Yeah. Am I audible now? Is it clear? Sometimes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to repeat it again. Yeah. What I was saying that if we see this uh, analogy or application of this word in our spiritual practice, then, you know, the appropriate thing is that we must focus on our, uh, you know, spiritual activity, uh, whatever it is, like following 16, uh, following four regulative principles, 16 outstanding, and we must not get attached to the result of what I'm getting, you know, in return of that. So, a devotee must have their while practicing his but what about our material activities? What about other activities which you do? Not besides the chanting, you know, other things. Like Arjuna, he's going to fight a battle, you know. You know, is that spiritual? If he's fighting at the will of Krishna, yes, it is spiritual. Okay. If he fights. So you're saying. Everything ultimate for the devotee, if one is in Krishna consciousness, everything is spiritual. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So then the appropriate mood is there. What then what's inappropriate? Inappropriate is, you know, I had done something and nobody has given me any, you know, like hankering for hankering for appreciation and hankering for uh, you know, recognition, again I'm talking in spiritual sense. Okay. One wants to be recognized, honor, distinction. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Anybody else like to comment on this? Amar, in inappropriate uh, uh, could be some people say that work is worship or work is everything. We just have to do our duties, rest, nothing is important. Okay, yes, that's an interesting one. You bring up that quote, yes, yeah, people say work is worship and they just do work and <laughs> and then what happens to the fruit, right? <laughs> what happens to the fruit? The work is worship, but who gets the fruit? Oh no, that's, <laughs> that's separate. Don't worry about the fruit. Yes, work is worship. Uh, it's certainly used a lot. People are fond of that. They like to justify their absorption in material life and in their activities. And they think that, that in itself is worship. Yeah. 
Yeah? Anybody else? Maharaj, somebody may say uh, uh, that, oh, you know, uh, we can just do our duty. Then it cannot be justified in terms of grossly sinful activities like butchers. Like they cannot say, oh, I'm doing my duty. Like, you know, I, that, 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 that is not like, it, that's not what it means here. Not any kind of work is uh, karmanya vati karaste. Ah, yes, yeah. Not that you can just do anything, right? Some people may say like that. Mm. <laughs> Even but somebody's a butcher working in the slaughterhouse. And you say, no, this is my adhikar. It's like that for this kind of work. Yes, and in the same way people may say that, uh, well, Arjuna, his qualification was for work. Arjuna was a kshatriya. I'm not a kshatriya. So I, I don't have the eligibility for work, so I don't have to work. Arjuna has to work because he's a Kshatriya. Kshatriyas, they should do the work, you know. But I'm, I'm not a Kshatriya, I'm a Brahmana or I'm a Sudra. You know, I don't have to work, I shouldn't have to work. It's just, just for Kshatriyas, let them do the work. I'll just enjoy. I'll just sit back and watch Arjuna work. We may take that kind of mood. I may say that according to caste, I'm not qualified. Arjuna, he had the caste, he had the, the birth, he was a Kshatriya. And so by birth I'm not, I'm not supposed to work like that. And in this way we avoid work. You know, I'm a Brahmana, I'm not supposed to work, I'm not supposed to clean a dirty place. I'm not supposed to clean, that's for the, the other people to do. Hmm. All right. So appropriate and inappropriate application. We have to use, try to understand what is the appropriate. Here Prabhupada explains a little bit. Here the Lord says that you cannot stop your work, neither you can enjoy the activities, the fruit of your activities. That is the work on spiritual plane. So Prabhupada is explaining here that what is appropriate is you have to work and you work for the pleasure of Krishna, not just simply for our own self. You cannot enjoy the fruit. We have to work on the spiritual plane. So this is the proper application of this phrase. We said karma yoga. Karma yoga, it means karma is, it's not just karma, but it's karma yoga. So it's working for giving the fruit to Krishna. So this is the idea that we have to work. And, but if we work for our own pleasure, then it's, that's karma. It's not karma yoga. Going ahead, text number 48. Perform your duty equipoised, Arjuna, abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Such equanimity is called yoga. Yoga stakura karmani sangam thakva dananjaya siddhya siddhyo samo buddhva samadvam yoga uchyate. Abandon all attachment to success or failure. So Arjuna is being encouraged not to be attached. There has to be this detachment. There has to be that control of the mind, equanimity, equipoised. This is actually yoga. So although Arjuna has to fight in the battlefield, and it must be, just imagine how difficult it must be to control the mind and to be equipoised when you're in a situation of life and death. And so this is, anyway, this is the, the highest purpose of yoga. And people sometimes wonder, you know, why Krishna is talking all these things on a battlefield? How is it relevant to the battlefield? Well, remember Arjuna, 
came before Krishna with reasons why he didn't want to fight. And one of the reasons was sinful reactions. So Lord Krishna is telling him how he can avoid the sinful reactions. We have to be detached. There has to be that control of the mind, even in this very uh, fearful situation. Prabhupada quotes in the purport, Lord Krishna now directly says that Arjuna should fight for the sake of fighting because he desires the battle. That is the indirect hint given by Krishna to Arjuna in this verse. Right? And then quote, that's from text 38 and then from 48 both time purports in text 48 Prabhupada is written Indirectly, Arjuna was advised to act as Krishna told him. So, let's look again, text 48. Yeah, here we have Krishna is telling Arjuna he wants him to fight. So, even in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, Lord Krishna is already encouraging Arjuna what he wants him to do. Indirectly, he didn't directly come out and say it, but you can see the implication is that Arjuna should fight, that he should do what Krishna wants. So this is the instruction. Going ahead, text 49, Lord Krishna condemns desirable activities, kamya karma desirable activities. Kripana Palahetava, those who want to enjoy the fruits of their work are misers. All right, we heard, karmani evadikaraste ma pali shukadachana, we should not want to enjoy the fruit. And now Lord Krishna is saying, you want to enjoy the fruit of their work, this is a miserly person. We're just thinking about only our, we're thinking only of our own benefit, our own self. So this is not encouraged. You, if you look back to the purport, uh, chapter 2, text number uh, 7, where Krishna, where Arjuna surrendered to Krishna, in the purport Prabhupada talks about the Brahmana and the Kripana. The Brahmana is the generous person. And the Kripana is the miserly person. And Prabhupada explains the nature of the miserly person. They have the human form of life. They don't want to use it for self-realization. The Brahmana, he is the generous person. He will do everything for others without thinking of his own self. He's willing to give everything. He can sacrifice his body for the benefit of others. So the Brahmana is the, con the opposite of the Kripana. We want to become on the Brahmanical platform, like that. We want to become Brahmanical in nature. Don't be miserly. Don't be a Kripana. All right. Text number 50. A man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad reactions, even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. A man engaged in devotional service. So if we do bhakti, of course here it's not actually mentioning bhakti yoga, but Prabhupada is, because it's buddhi yoga, and we said buddhi yoga is practically the same as bhakti yoga. So you do buddhi yoga or bhakti yoga, no difference. You, you get rid of both good and bad reactions. Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna that he should do this kind of yoga. Then no, no reactions. No, you don't have to worry about sinful reactions because you're doing buddhi yoga. 
The art of work is to act in such a way that we become free from both good and bad reactions. Jnanis desire to become free of reactions by renouncing all activities. The same effect can be more easily achieved by acting with detachment. And then uh, Prabhupada gives an example. For example, Mercury is poison, but in the hands of an Ayurvedic doctor, mercury becomes a powerful medicine. Similarly, while regular attached work entangles the soul in the material world, detached, dutiful work performed in knowledge and aimed at pleasing the Supreme leads him to liberation. So this is a very nice example how mercury is a poison but when it's used by the expert doctor it's a medicine. So then Prabhupada compares, he said, regular work, just like ordinary people, karmis, they may be very regular in their work but they're very attached, they're very attached to enjoying the work and the fruit of the work in the material world. They're not at all detached. But for those who are working in, in knowledge and trying to please the Supreme, then it's very different. We may be doing the same work, but a very different consciousness. So in this way, if we're actually working at pleasing the Supreme, then we can get liberation from the material world. So this is the idea, buddhi yoga, detached work that can free us from the material world. The jnanis on the other hand, they want to stop all activities. They want, they think oh, all work will bring karma and they want to stop all the activities. And they think that way no, no karma. But it doesn't work. It, that, well, that's a very difficult thing to do, to stop all activities. Who can do it? I was just uh, doing another program just uh, the other evening and there was one man and he told me he was 77 years of age and he's still working. I said, you're 77 years of age, you're still working. He said, yeah, it's very, he said, I can't just do nothing. I have to do something. So <laughs> even at, the, you know, 77 years of age, elderly, the last stage of life, but still people want to work. They work till they drop. You know, so he said, I can't just sit home and do nothing. <laughs> Even in, you know, in, the, in the old age, you can't do nothing. So people don't know how to practice spiritual life. Of course, we're supposed to stop work by the age of 50. The Vedas say, Pancha Sorvam Vanam Brajit. You should go and live in the forest. But who can do it? People are still, this man was living in New York, in New York City. He was from Nepal and he was living in New York City, still working as an engineer. My goodness, you know, what's the point? He's going to die very soon. He's still working, make money. Why? He said, I can't, can't just sit home and do nothing. People don't know how to actually engage themselves in spiritual activities. Okay. Going ahead, here's a quote from Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th chapter, because Narada Muni had also spoke about these things to Srila Vyasadeva. Because Srila Vyasadeva, he'd encouraged people. Before he wrote Srimad Bhagavatam, he had written so many other scriptures, but he'd simply encouraged people in the path of uh, Vedic rituals and so on. So that's why he didn't find satisfaction. And Narada Muni, his spiritual master, then came and instructed him that you have not encouraged people in the path of devotional service. 
Therefore, you don't feel any satisfaction. So reading this quote, O good soul, Narada is speaking to Vyasa, does not a thing applied therapeutically cure a disease which was caused by that very same thing? Uh, there may be, there may be, for example, you may have a thorn in your, in your finger and it's giving you a lot of pain, your finger became poison. So then you take another thorn and you use that thorn to get that thorn out, the one which is in your finger, you use that thorn to get the other thorn out of your finger. It's a simple example. Something applied therapeutically, Prabhupada gave the example mercury, can, it, it, it can cure the disease. The disease may have been caused by mercury, but the use of mercury as a medicine can cure. Thus, when all a man's activities are dedicated to the service of the Lord, those very activities which cause the perpetual bondage become the destroyer of the tree of work. All right, so the activities have to be dedicated for the pleasure of Krishna. Then no karma. Coming back to Bhagavad Gita, text 51. By thus engaging in devotional service to the Lord, great sages or devotees free themselves from the results of work in the material world. In this way they become free from the cycle of birth and death and attain the state beyond all miseries by going back to Godhead. Again, Buddha Yoga is not mentioned, but Prabhupada is put there engaging in devotional service. And it's not Bhakti Yoga, rather, it's Buddha Yoga. You see, Karma Jam Buddha Yukta He. It's Buddha Yoga which is mentioned, but Prabhupada said just the same, devotional service. So you get free from the reactions of work. Become free from the cycle of birth and death and go back to Godhead. And then speaking, who's, who's, who's qualified to go back to Godhead? What's the eligibility to enter Vaikuntha Loka? Janma Bandha Vanir Muktam Padam Gaj Chanti Anamayam Text 51 One who understands his real constitutional position as the eternal servitor of the Lord and knows the position of the personality of Godhead, engages himself in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Consequently, he becomes qualified to enter into the Vaikuntha planets where there is neither material, miserable life, nor the influence of time and death. So this is the eligibility. We have to know the position of Krishna and we have to engage in his loving service. So that's what's required. You want to enter, just like you want to go to America, you have to have a visa. Maybe you have to have even, you want to go to Malaysia, you have to have vaccination or something. <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> So here, we want to go to Vaikuntha, you have to have love for Krishna. You have to do service for Krishna, you have to be engaged in his service. Then you can go. So text 52 and 53, speaking about going to Vaikuntha Loka by steady intelligence. 52. When your intelligence is passed out of the dense forest of delusion. What is that dense forest of delusion? Anybody know? What is that dense forest of delusion? When your intelligence has passed out of the dense forest of delusion, you shall become indifferent to all that has been heard and all that is to be heard. Who knows, what is the dense forest of delusion? 
marriage considering oneself to be the body and not soul thinking everything at a bodily platform that is the delusion we are in okay everyone agree with that anybody else Okay, 53. When your mind is no longer disturbed by the flowery language of the Vedas, and when it remains fixed in the trance of self-realization, then you will have attained the divine, the divine consciousness. Now, why is the Vedas described as flowery language? Someone explain to me. Why is the Vedas described as flowery language? Yes? That's because they are not uh, as the flower dwindles by the end, like, you know, after some time, the benefits derived from studying Vedas also are not permanent, like temporary. Yes. But also the, the flowers look very attractive, right? Flowers are very beautiful. They have a fragrance, they have color, they're so nice, they look so good, right? But, of course, very temporary. So the, the Vedas is like that. It's very attractive, we hear it, oh, so nice, you know. And so we should be careful not to be bewildered. So when we're no longer disturbed by the Vedas, and we are fixed in self-realization, then we have come to the Divine Consciousness. All right? Actually, what I was asking you, what is that dense forest of delusion? The Moha Kali Lam? Moha Kali Lam, the dense forest of delusion. Here Krishna compares Karma Kandi section of the Vedas to the dense forest of delusion, of illusion. So it's not just simply thinking we're the body, but it's that particular idea that, you know, we'll use the Vedas to satisfy our material desires. The Karma Kandi section of the Vedas, which promises so many things. Go to heaven, all the things we want, all material needs, everything. We'll just do a Vedic ritual, we'll get everything we want. We'll solve all of our problems by Karma Kanda. This is the forest of illusion, right? Moha Kali Lam. So come out from that forest. When your intelligence is passed out of that forest of delusion, you will become indifferent. Right? I was speaking to the devotee from Malaysia there and I asked her, did you do a karma candy activity? And she had. She told me, yeah. She said when someone in her family passed away, they go to the temple and they do some prayers from the, the karma candy Brahman, offer prayers for the forefathers. This is karma kandi worship. But devotees, we don't need to do these things. We're engaged in bhakti yoga. We have our devotional prayers. We want to benefit the forefathers. We do bhakti yoga. They benefit. They all benefit. Oh, Madhavendra Puri's prayer. Who can read Sanskrit? Who would like to read this verse for me? Anybody? I'd like to hear you chant it. I don't know what the meter should be. Any of you good in Sanskrit? Some of you chanted very nicely previously. Yes? Who would like to chant? Go ahead. Anybody? <laughs> Shama sham, uh, Shamyatam Yatra Kwapi Mishadya Yadava Kulutok uh, Kulutam Masatya Vamsadvisha 
स्मारम स्मारम अघम धरामि तद अलम मन्ये किम अन्ये नमि Very good. Thank you, Madhuji. Very nice. Please, you can read the English, Madhuji. Oh, my prayers three times a day, all glory to you. Oh, bathing, I offer my obeisances unto you. Oh, demigods, oh, forefathers, please excuse me for my inability to offer you my respects. Now, wherever I sit, I can remember the great descendant of the Yudu dynasty, Krishna, the enemy of Kamsa, and thereby I can free myself from all sinful bondage. I think this is sufficient for me. So, what's the point here? Why did Prabhupada quote this verse in the purport? By offering our prayers to Krishna, we can you know, automatically satisfy all our demigods and forefathers. Yes, right. All the karma kandi rituals, they don't have to be done. No need to do them. You just simply worship Krishna. And this way you get everything taken care of. Right. Okay, we'll go ahead. So Arjuna has defeated, or Krishna has defeated Arjuna's arguments. Compassion was defeated by knowledge of the soul. And then we heard also how karma kanda defeated also enjoyment, sinful reactions, indecision. Now we're hearing also buddhi yoga and karma yoga. Buddhi yoga and karma yoga are practically the same thing, that there's no reaction. So sinful reactions are also removed. Everything is nullified. By doing buddhi yoga, karma yoga, Arjuna is not going to get any reactions. So he doesn't have to worry. So Arjuna's arguments have been defeated. Right? Evaluation. Right? We spoke about the relevance of the karma kandi division of the Vedas in the practice of Krishna consciousness with reference to verses and analogies from Bhagavad Gita. Right? Is it relevant, Karma Kandi division? We evaluate, no we evaluate, not relevant, right? Not necessary for us in Krishna consciousness. Oh, these people are more, these people doing Karma Kandi activities, they're on the bodily platform, they're going to be entangled. They think there's nothing else. Then Vaishnava integrity, appropriate and inappropriate application of karmani eva dikaraste, appropriate application, that we should work, and we should work in a detached manner, offering the fruit to Krishna. And the inappropriate application is that we just work, and I just enjoy the work. Work is worship, this is Mataji said. We're thinking that, that, so this is inappropriate, we, we simply work for our own enjoyment, for our own gain, benefit. So we have to work in a detached manner. We have to work. Nobody should be idle, everyone should work. And then the significance of the terms pradyavayo navijate, pradyavayo navijate meaning there's no loss and no diminution. In this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution. People may be worried that if I do devotional service, oh, I'm not going to benefit. Oh, what's the point? I don't want to do it. People like that, they're, they're afraid. To, they're afraid to... That, uh, I'll, I'll, later on, Arjuna will also ask Krishna that late in the sixth chapter we see Arjuna asking Krishna that what if I take to this process and I'm not successful? And so people worry like that, you know, if I'm going to do this, if I endeavor to become Krishna conscious or to do buddhi yoga, then I'm going, because you say I shouldn't, I shouldn't value the fruit, then I'm going to lose. But Krishna said, there's no loss and no diminution. You don't lose anything. Rather, you get the greatest benefit. 
and then vaya vasai atmika buddhi that we have to become focused, fully concentrated on the service of Krishna. Not, don't, be, don't let the mind be diverted. Mm. Be focused on giving pleasure to Krishna. Just like we said Prabhupada went to America. What was Prabhupada's mood in going to America? You know, Prabhupada wrote his prayers, his arrival prayers. He said, uh, I don't know why you brought me to this place. Most of the people are covered by passion and ignorance. I don't know how they will ever understand the message of Vyasadeva. But I know you must have some reason, otherwise why you had, would have brought me to this place. And then Prabhupada said, so make me dance, make me dance. So like that Prabhupada was very focused on what he wanted to do, and his mission in coming to America. He didn't come to just look, he came to do something. So he was very focused on what he wanted. And that, that's very much important, very essential for devotional service. Right? Okay, concluding quote here. Karma means work with some fruitive result. I am working in Krishna consciousness just to get some profit out of it. No, this should not be done. <laughs> Right? We're not working just to get some profit out of Krishna. That's not the mood. What's the mood? What should be the mood? What should be done? We should work in such a way that it's pleasing to Krishna and we don't right. work, think about the results. Right. We want to please Krishna. Right. That's the idea. Okay, so we're going to go on tomorrow and we will finish the second chapter. And we will also begin the third chapter. So you can look over the first section, the first nine verses of the third chapter. Contents of the Gita summarized. Second chapter. Okay. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. And just a minute, and I was supposed, I'm supposed to give you a verse, uh, or I, I'll give you the essay which we want you to do. Just wait a minute.
Look, I'm sorry, I, somebody's taken my book away from me. I don't have my book, but I wanted, there was one essay which we, I was going to give you to do. It was concerning about lust. Have you got your, have you got the book there? With the different essays? Yes, Maharaj. Do you see that essay? There's one essay about writing about conquering lust. Draw general principles in your own words from Krishna's analysis of lust in 3.36 to 43 and discuss the application of these principles in your own Krishna consciousness. Yes. Give reference to some Sanskrit words and phrases from the above mentioned section of the verse and to, analo and to the analogies from the purport. Right. So that's the verse. That's the question I wanted you to do. Now you already have one, right? In the, 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 the first week, the devotee already gave you one question to do. So some of the devotees were asking, they wanted to keep that verse, question because they'd already begun work on it. So I've only selected the other question. So you can add that. So this way you have two questions, two essay questions to work on. Are there any other any questions? Are you okay with the open book, uh, the, the closed book questions there, which are in your student handbook? You can work through them. All of the answers are there in the purports. You just have to go through them part by part. Maharaj, I have a question in relation to this one you just gave. Yes. Maharaj, what does it mean to draw general principles? What, what does that mean, like, draw principles, like, that's... Well, draw general principles. We want to hear what kind of things, you, what, how are you going to go about doing it? What, you have to control lust. You have to, how are we going to purify this lust? So what are you going to do? There are certain things to do it. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita mentions about how to conquer over lust, that we have to cultivate spiritual knowledge, and we have to regulate the senses. So how are you going to do this? You know, what is your regulation going to be, and how are you going to cultivate your spiritual knowledge? And so there should be some principles there and describe to us how you're going to go about conquering over the enemy lust. How are you going to apply this, this, this information which Lord Krishna has given you? Lord Krishna has told us where the lust is and he's told us also how to conquer it, how to deal with it. So how are you going to apply this information Krishna has given you? How are you going to go about it? We want to hear practically, how are you going to go about getting this uh, lust out of the heart or purifying it? The word for lust is calm. So calm is also desire. It can also be spiritual, right? There's spiritual desire, spiritual lust and material lust. We want to purify that lust. Anyway, well, that's the third chapter. We'll come to that. Okay, any other questions? All right, so then we'll stop here today and I'll meet you tomorrow at the same time. And you can look over the rest of the chapter and go into the third chapter. All right, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Okay, Prabhu.